All right, hi fairies. So this is gonna be the first little episode of a new series where I do my makeup. Nothing new, nothing changed, same old shit. But also talk to you guys a little bit about world mythology, one of my favorite mythological stories, as well as their historical and anthropological context. Okay, that's cool. Because it seems a lot of people find this stuff interesting and I'm really glad they do because I have absolutely no problem going on and on and on and on about it. And they said an anthropology major was useless. But my idea of this series is definitely inspired by Bailey Saren's murder and makeup series so she was the pink print on that most definitely bow down to the queen bitches bow the subject of this video is going to be the myth of chunga the spirit of the moon in chinese folklore as well as the story of the jade rabbit because jade rabbit and chunga are kind of like this hey bestie a lot of people seem to focus on the story of chunga but what they don't realize is that jade rabbit is debatably one of the most important figures in chinese folklore so if you're interested in hearing these stories as well as my opinion and interpretation as a completely unqualified individual that just happened to read a book on this, then keep on watching. So firstly, let me tell you the story of Chang'e. The version of the story I'm going to be reading to you tonight is from Asian Mythology, A Captivating Guide to Chinese, Japanese, and Hindu Mythology by Matt Clayton. So the story begins with the legendary archer Yi, or he's also known by Ho Yi. Now Ho Yi had a very beautiful wife whose name was Chang'e. Historically, she was also known as Hanga, but we'll get into that later. <laughs> now the supreme and high deity of all of Chinese folklore is known as the Jade Emperor. The Jade Emperor had 10 unruly sons, and one one day his sons, the ten sons, decided to turn into ten sons. You know, and as you can imagine, ten sons in the sky at one time is definitely not good for life. And the Jade Emperor's sons were unruly, meaning they didn't listen to him when he asked them to stop. Sons? What do you want? You playing croc, you old fucking bastard! But Ho Yi was one of the best archers and hunters in all of ancient China. So Ho Yi took it upon himself to save the world, pretty much. Mm -hmm. So he climbed to one of the tallest mountains and was greeted by a god who varies depending on the source, but in this scenario, she is the Queen Mother of the West, who is the wife of the Jade Emperor. And she handed him a bow made of vermilion and arrows with silk cords. Ho Yi notched one of these magic arrows and fired at one of the suns. Instantly, its light snuffled out and it fell out of the sky like a giant phoenix. Mm. Hoi continued and shot down the other nine, and with one son remaining, Team Kim. No, don't do it. He made the last son, son, promise to give way to the moon every day at dusk, and thus balance was restored to the earth. Now here's where our main girl Chunga begins to come in. Hey, bestie. Now as a reward for saving the earth, the same god that gave him the bow and arrow gave him some of the elixir of immortality, which we're going to talk about when we talk about the Jade Rabbit. But this is basically an elixir that can turn someone immortal or can turn them into a god depending on how much they take. Here's the sticky situation. The amount of elixir he was given was enough to make one person a full-fledged god. However, if two people were to split the elixir, they would merely become immortal or undying. The difference being that gods have really awesome, cool powers and they can live in the heavens, whereas an ordinary immortal is just a person who doesn't age or die. Yeah, I'm a bad bitch, you can't kill me! Hoyi did not want to take the elixir because he knew he would have to watch the love of his life die and age. I am trying to... I'm smack camp. He could also share the elixir with Chunga, but the opportunity of godhood was just something far too tantalizing. Hoi told Chunga everything, and Chunga completely understood, and they both agreed to store the elixir at their home until he made a decision. Okay. And here's where the plot thickens. T. Ho Yi had an apprentice named Fang Meng. He knew that he could never be the best while his master was still alive. So Fang Meng realized the only way to be the best archer in all of the world is to either kill his master or become immortal. And he decided to scheme for the latter. When I see you, you getting lit up, bitch. It ain't no word. Quick side note though, I just tried out the one size setting powder. I think it looks really good. It looks so airbrushed. But anyway, so one day when Ho Yi was out hunting monsters, hunting, doing whatever he does. I'm at 7-Eleven, y'all want? Fang Meng, the apprentice, pretended to be sick to draw suspicion away from himself. And then when Ho Yi was out but Cheng e, his wife, was home, he broke in while Cheng e was still there. So Fang Meng was pretty much tearing up the entire house looking for the elixir, checking under the floorboards, destroying the upholstery, everything, making an absolute mess while Chang'e was hiding in the bedroom with the elixir. Where is it? I need it, I need it. But imagine the bottle opaque though. 
Okay. It doesn't say that, but just in your mind, imagine that the bottle isn't clear glass. It's like a ceramic of some kind. Like you can't see through it. That's an important detail. You'll know why in a second. Chang'e asked him, why would you do this to Ho Yi? And Feng Ming responded, I cannot live in his shadow forever. Give me the elixir. And he drew an arrow from his little bow and arrow. And he, what's the word for it? Notched it. He notched it. There we go. Dyslexia. He notched it and aimed it right at Chang'e's cheek. Give it to me now. And then Chang'e looked at him full of sadness, sorrow, and disappointment. Constant lowering the bar for us all. And then she chucked that shit across the room. Yay! And Fang Ming dropped his bow and arrow and lunged for the bottle to catch it. I'm and in my head, I have this whole like dramatic storyboard sequence of the bottle like turning in mid air and like slow motion. I'm so creative like that. Very much that. It's a very dramatic moment. But she threw the bottle or dropped the bottle or something, and Fang Ming dropped his bow and arrow and lunged for it. But then when he caught it, he realized the bottle was empty. What the fuck is going on in here on this day? There's the plot twist. Caught me off guard. I did not expect it. See, that's why it was important in your mind to visualize the bottle being opaque and ceramic because the whole, that's the plot twist, the bottle being empty. And then Chunga looked at him and she said, I heard you sneak in, so I drank it all. <laughs> Fuck my drag, right? But in this version, it's stated that a god cannot live amongst humans. They kind of have to live in the stars. They have to live in the heavens and the sky with the other gods. And now that Chunga was basically a god, she couldn't stay here on Earth. She couldn't remain here with Hoi. So she basically levitated. She rise. Bye, bitch. <laughs> This part of the story is actually a very popular motif in artwork. It's known as the Ascent of Chunga, and it basically pictures her floating slowly up to the moon with beautiful flowing fabric. And in my mind, I made the comparison to the Aurora Borealis, because to me, the northern lights kind of look like big flowing pieces of fabric in the sky, and I just thought it was an interesting comparison. Hint, hint. But instead of staying amongst the stars with the other gods, she chose to stay on the moon, because the moon would be closer to the Earth. Hello? So that's why Chunga is kind of seen as like a, almost like a tragic, sad story. Ho Yi returned home later and he kind of realized what had happened because Chunga wasn't home. What the fuck is going on? Oh no. Oh fuck. So he fell to his knees and wept, but he gathered the strength, gathered the strength to rise and gather all of Chunga's favorite fruits, her favorite vegetables, her favorite baked goods. And on a clear night where the moon was full, he laid them out for Chunga as an offering to her. Mm. Tastes very good. And the other villagers overheard of her sacrifice. So they also, on the night of the full moon, laid out cakes and fruits for her. That day is August 15th on the lunar calendar. But I believe in the Gregorian calendar, like September, October-ish. But I digress because the significance of that is that was actually the first mid-autumn festival. Now the mid-autumn festival is a holiday which is still celebrated throughout Asia, pretty much everywhere except the Philippines. I asked a lot of my Filipino relatives, so I have tea on that. I'll get into that when we talk about the anthropology of it all. Look at that pimple there, ew. All right, so moving on to the story of the Jade Rabbit. This one actually was surprisingly difficult to research. I downloaded the top three textbooks on Chinese mythology on Amazon, and I couldn't find any mention of the Jade Rabbit. Oh, well, I'm gonna need a refund. That's something you should have told me before I said it. Uh, I really wanted my sources for this part to be super bougie, like mm, a textbook, but I ended up just printing out some articles on Google. I'm sorry. I tried my best, okay. This is exactly what I was afraid of. All right, so. So the story of the Jade Rabbit and the story of Chenga share a common element. Besides the most obvious one being the moon, the element that I'm talking about is the elixir of immortality. But in order to understand that sacred narrative, we also need to understand what exactly the elixir of immortality is, how it works. So I did a little bit of research into that and I will tell you how to make some yourself because one of the books I, one of the books I was doing research in actually listed a potential recipe. The elixir of immortality isn't just one thing. It's kind of like an umbrella term for all of these various substances or medicines or potions that have the ability to extend life. So think of the elixir of immortality actually being the elixirs of immortality, something with multiple formulations, multiple different strengths, different effects. Also, despite the name, it seems that this object doesn't simply grant immortality, it actually enables it. Because a common theme amongst the sources I reviewed is that you actually need to constantly consume this elixir in regular intervals in order to maintain immortality. So the elixir of immortality is actually something that extends life as opposed to merely preserving it indefinitely. And that's period. In some stories, they're kind of like solid pills or tablets. In other stories, they're syrupy elixirs and liquids, maybe even suppositories. Who knows? <laughs> Yo. But the recipe I actually found is contained within Jeremy Roberts Chinese Mythology A to Z second edition. Let's get cooking. Mm -hmm. 
So first you're gonna wanna heat up your vessel to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Now the first ingredient you need is a little bit of an interesting one. You're gonna need either a pinch of cinnabar or a touch of gold. Cinnabar is another word for vermilion. It's a very toxic uh, mercury oxide. Historically, it was used as a pigment to dye clothing or make paint, but it causes cancer. So I don't have any cinnabar or vermilion, but I do have a little bit of gold. Hopefully 14 karat will do. The next ingredient you're gonna need is either jade or powdered mother of pearl. Now I'm fresh out of powdered mother of pearl, but I do have just a little bit of jade right here. The next thing you're gonna need is spring water from various legendary sources and fountains. Now the fourth ingredient is one that varies depending on the source. It can either be a very rare fungus known as Ling Shi, or it can be the flesh of one of the golden peaches from the Queen Mother of the West Garden. I don't have any of those golden peaches. I'm gonna be using Ling Shi because I find that it develops the flavor a little bit better. And last but not least, this is the most important ingredient. The last ingredient in the elixir of immortality is ginseng. Yes. Ooh. This is the finishing touch of the smoothie. That's the finishing touch. I'm about to try my smoothie. Mm, very good. Oh, fuck. Now that you understand the way that works, let me tell you where it comes from, or at least who makes it. Also, I'm starting eyes right now, and I just wanted to note quick little interjection. I'm using the Lunar Beauty Eternal Eclipse palette. This video is very heavily like moon related, and so is this palette. So I just wanted to just wanted to put it out there because the correlation was too good to pass up. Oh, that's good for you, baby. Now, the story of the Jade Rabbit is much like the story of Chunga, where it has kind of spread amongst Asia. There are many different regional variants about what exactly he is, what exactly he's doing. Doing, where exactly he came from. I'll talk about that in the historical part, but for now I'm going to be telling you the Chinese folklore version of this story. So one day the Jade Emperor decided that he wanted a little bit of help, or at least hire someone to make the elixir for him. I can't. Now the Jade Emperor is a very wise character, so in his eyes he thought that humans were too corrupt or too corruptible. He didn't really trust them because the power to manipulate and control death was something that he thought was a little bit too tantalizing for the human mind. So he decided to look for an animal to do the job. The Jade Emperor descended to Earth disguised as an old man, like a very feeble, starving old man. So the Jade Emperor found his way into a forest. And in this forest, he found a monkey, a fox, and a rabbit. Oh, monkey. And when he saw these three animals, he asked them to help him. He said, I'm gonna die. I need you to find me something to eat or else I'm gonna die. I'm a frail old man. I want something to eat. Sweet, sweet chocolate. So the monkey, fox, and rabbit were all sympathetic towards him, and they all set out across the forest to find some food for the old man. The monkey had climbed to the tallest tree in the forest and picked the old man a bunch of delicious fruits. The fox had run over to a nearby stream and caught the old man a fish, something foxes are good at. Okay. The rabbit searched all across the forest, but all he could find was grass, because that's what rabbits eat, grass. Fuck my drag, right? He saw the old man sitting next to a fire, preparing the fish and the fruit. He felt so sad for the old man, in fact, that he actually chose to sacrifice himself by jumping into the old man's fire, offering up his own meat, his own flesh, and set me on fire. In an instant, the fire went out and the rabbit wasn't harmed at all, even though he literally jumped into fire. Yes. And the old man instantly transformed. He had crystallized back into the Jade Emperor. I had crystallized. Oh. And in that moment, he decided that the rabbit was the most noble and kind-hearted of all of the forest creatures. So he and the rabbit ascended back to his kingdom in the stars. I levitated. Where he taught the rabbit how to make the elixir of immortality. And he gave him like his own little, his own little pharmacy place. He also granted the rabbit immortality. And by doing so, he gave the rabbit fur as white as jade. Yes. And that may confuse certain people thinking like, wait, isn't jade green? That is true, but the thing is jade can actually come in multiple different colors and it is an extremely precious stone. So the rabbit isn't actually green, it just shines like a gemstone. That's kind of the metaphor, I think. Uh, see, I'm telling you, I have the mind of a master. So the jade rabbit got a pretty sweet gig going for him for an actual rabbit until one day plot thickens. Tea. The queen mother of the west comes into his little workshop and says, I need more, I, I need extra elixir, I need a refill. And the jade rabbit basically says, I don't know if I can do that because the jade emperor told me only to give enough to sustain each individual god. Okay, and what do you want me to do about that? So the queen mother of the west, being the queen mother, does not take no for an answer. So she threatens the jade rabbit. She says, I'm going to curse you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna light everything in this room on fire and I'm gonna turn you into a frog. That's what she does. 
realize. I am so powerful. Give it to me now. She does not hesitate. So the rabbit at this point is kind of scared because he can literally disobey his boss, the most powerful god in the pantheon, or he can be cursed by whatever the queen mother was about to do to him. Skedaddle, skedoodle, your dick is now a noodle. <laughs> It's not the rabbit's fault for what happens next, is what I'm saying. He gave in, and he gave the queen mother what she wanted, which was an extra dose of the elixir he just prepared. And, oh, what she say? Queen. Now here's where the plot twist comes in. That very elixir he gave the queen mother was actually the exact same bottle she gave to Hoi, and inevitably Chung -a ended up drinking. The tea is exceptionally good today. And obviously when Chung -a shot up to the moon, the Jade Emperor kind of overheard. The Jade Emperor was furious. I am fucking Furious! Furious, he stormed into the Jade Rabbit's pharmacy and was like, what did you do? Miley, what's good? And the Jade Rabbit instantly confessed everything. He said that he was the one that broke the rules by giving the Queen Mother extra elixir. And he was begging for mercy and forgiveness from the Jade Emperor. And the Jade Emperor, he, he was kind of cool. I don't agree that he didn't punish the Queen Mother. The Jade Emperor was still kind of cool. He was like, okay, I, I, I get it. I'm not gonna punish you because you admitted you're wrong. I'm going to leave it to you to determine an appropriate punishment for yourself. So the Jade Rabbit thought for a moment. Fuck my drag, right? He said, well, it's my fault Chung -a is alone on the moon forever. Hey, bestie. So naturally, I should be condemned to the same fate. And the Jade Emperor actually liked this idea because if he were to put the rabbit on the moon with Chung -a, not only did he think it was a logical and appropriate punishment, but he also thought it would protect the Jade Rabbit from other gods and goddesses that might do the same thing as the Queen Mother. The moon would kind of be his sanctuary where he could work in peace, undisturbed and unthreatened. So the Jade Rabbit packed up all his stuff and went off to the moon to live with Chung -a in isolation forever. Hey, bestie. All right, so I finished eyes off camera because I'm going to need all my attention span for this upcoming part. Really quick though, I really, really like this palette. It's so pretty. Like truly. What was I gonna talk about now? <laughs> But let's dive into the historic background of these two stories before we actually get into the anthropological modern day kind of implications of them. It seems that the most widely accepted theory is that the story of the Jade Rabbit actually originated in ancient Buddhist texts known as the Jataka. Tale number 316, also known as the Tale of the Selfless Rabbit, is nearly identical to the story I told you previously. But reading the story, you can definitely see a correlation between the two. So I feel like it's a very safe and fair assumption to say that the Jataka, an ancient Buddhist text inspired the modern day practice. Now, unlike the story of the Jade Rabbit, I wasn't able to find a Buddhist precursor story for Chunga. According to the Handbook of Chinese Mythology by ABC Clio, the earliest known mention of Chunga dates from the 5th century BC, which is over 2,500 years ago. And it likely originated as a shaman divination, so it was a kind of like an incomplete collection of events. And the story continually developed over time, and eventually the complete story of Chunga, or something we'd recognize as her story. The first known appearance of that is towards the beginning of the Han, dynasty, so the story was cooking for about 500 years. And as stated before, the story of the Jade Rabbit developed independently, but for some unspecified reasons, the stories merged in the late Jin dynasty around 300 years later. I wanted to give you a little bit of historical background about this leading into the part where we talk about the modern practices. All throughout Asia, except the Philippines, I'll talk about that in just a second, it seems that the various cultures of Asia have their own kind of versions of figures like Chunga and the Jade Rabbit. Like Korea and Japan also have their own moon rabbit, but instead of pounding the elixir of immortality in his mortal pestle, he's pounding rice to make mochi. If you've ever played that game Okami, that reference is clearly apparent there. And when you trace these stories as far back as you can, you can see that they were originally religious stories. It's just a clear example of how the line between culture and religion can be extremely blurry sometimes, and how in a way religion inspires culture and culture inspires religion. And as stated before, these two stories did inspire the celebration of the Mid-Autumn Festival. Now there is a lot of cultural overlap surrounding this celebration, as a lot of places amongst Asia will actually celebrate something lunar related during this time. Keeping that relation in mind, it's a very fair assumption to say that there is definitely a religious or cultural precursor, like almost like a common ancestor. And as I just said, religion and culture, the line can be very blurry. That's why there's different regional variants everywhere except the Philippines. And I'll talk about that right now. I'm half Filipino. Island, girl, island. 
Tagalog, and I grew up in a Tagalog speaking household, even though I literally suck at speaking Tagalog. Leading up to this video, I did ask some of my relatives if they had any experience or if they knew anything about Chunga, and they pretty much said they have no idea what I'm talking about. Yeah, I hope I don't sound ridiculous. I don't know who this man is. They don't know anything about the Chinese sacred narrative. And if you kind of know anything about the Philippines or if you are Filipino yourself, the reason for that might be quite obvious, and it's because Christianity. <laughs> Like Latin America, there was like a Spanish, what's the word, conquistador, conquest. There's kind of like an indigenous original culture, but there is an overwhelming kind of Spaniard and Catholic Catholicism influence that's present there today, which leads the modern day culture to kind of be a little bit more syncretic in nature. Like the Philippines has its own unique cultural practices, but those are usually in relation to some kind of Christian event. But due to that fact that they function a little bit more Europeanly, if that's the way you say it, certain elements of original sacred narratives or cultural narratives is not being practice. You know, I did discuss with my grandma, I didn't record it, but my grandma actually wanted to be a nun in the Philippines. Nun. Nun. She's technically my grand aunt, but I still call her grandma. Mm. So I asked her if she knew anything about Chunga or if the name rung a bell and she said it really didn't. But then I described like the mooncakes, the lunar festivities, see if that rung a bell and it did. She said that when she lived in the Philippines, they did celebrate in some capacity, but based on what she was describing to me, it is most certainly much smaller and wasn't as uh, large or elaborate as other places. There were certain elements that are televised, but she was basically telling me that all the lunar festivities that occur in the Philippines come from like an ex external source. It's not really an internally practicing event. So I was, I was a little bit sad I couldn't get a personal source on that one. So I took to Twitter and I actually tweeted out asking if anyone would be willing to share their experiences. It's always celebrated on a full moon and cultural practices include eating mooncakes, feasting with family, release of cellophane lanterns, just to name a few. But among the responses I got on Twitter, it seems that the common element was family. And when I was doing research into the historic background of the holiday, it seemed that it was a celebration of harvest or potentially fertility like fertility of the land. Now that immediately kind of helped me find the structure or type. And I'm not saying this is the only interpretation of the holidays. I'm just saying this is my interpretation as a completely unqualified individual. But what I learned in my anthropology courses is there's two kinds of holidays. There's a rite of transition and a rite of intensification. Rites of transition mark and enunciate certain transitions or certain movements or transformations of some kind. An example of modern rites of transition would be New Year's or birthday parties. Whereas a rite of intensification is something that intensifies a culture value. Examples of these holidays are things like the 4th of July or Halloween. I'm bringing this up because usually harvest celebrations, when you boil them down, the reason behind the celebration is some kind of intensification of a cultural value. Obviously food is very important to humans and culture because we'll die if we don't eat. So celebrations of food, harvest, fertility, all that kind of stuff is pretty much culturally universal. The Mid-Autumn Festival follows a similar format. It's definitely a rite of intensification and I wanted to do a little bit of research and to figure out what exactly is the modern holiday intensify. The historical context may not necessarily be related to the modern practices and that's perfectly acceptable. You can try and dig and dig and dig and find the reason why Halloween we have jack-o'-lanterns, kids dressing up, all this, all this, all this. Basically what I'm trying to say is there can be more than one if not very very many cultural influences behind one single modern holiday. But I brought that up because I really wanted to find what was the cultural value being intensified. Historically it may have been harvest and fertility and such but what is the modern day connotation? Because as agriculture continues to develop and advance, the religious uh, connotation behind food decreases. Now, when I tweeted that out, I got a lot of replies, but it seemed that the common ground was a dinner with family or some kind of feast day with family kind of situation. Even in that Netflix movie, Over the Moon, there is a family dinner kind of part that is largely important to the plot. So my theory is that the modern day mid-autumn celebration is a rite of intensification surrounding values of familiar and interpersonal relations, as well as preserving traditional cultural values. But what? Allow me to elaborate. One of the most iconic attributes of this holiday is the mooncake. Hey, bestie. Items of confection are very interesting to talk about when you're talking about religion and culture. Think like the sugar skulls of Day of the Dead, some kind of food item that requires a raw natural resource to be processed. Now, some ingredients can be considered food, like for example, the importance of corn within the Mesoamerican sacred narratives. But corn, even though corn is really good. Hell yeah! Corn! Corn is kind of a raw natural ingredient and it's not something that potentially has a recipe behind it. It's, you know, it's just a, it's a plant. Whereas items like sugar skulls, or in this case, mooncakes, those are things that require a certain preparation, a recipe, if you will. And mooncakes aren't inherent to all of Asia. Like in Korea and Japan, for example, the emphasis is less on mooncakes than there is on a very specific kind of mochi or rice cake. But once again, you have something that requires a preparation, something that requires a recipe, something that requires a 
practice that is passed down through culture and tradition. See where I'm going with this? In S period. My theory is that that purpose is the preservation of tradition. I hate bringing up the Netflix movie because it's not that culturally accurate. <laughs> Hello? There's a song in the very beginning of the movie about the importance of mooncakes, not only within the family, but also within their kind of entire village, their entire area. It's not the actual mooncake itself that preserves the culture, but the practice of producing the mooncakes that does. And as for the intensification of familiar and interpersonal relations, think of it almost like Thanksgiving. It's a day in which family, I don't want to say is forced to come together, but there's a huge amount of social pressure for families to convene and come together. Well, every Thanksgiving except this year, because you know. Period. The fuck? So if you want to think of things like a robot AI that's like categorizing all of human history, one way of doing that would be to view the Mid-Autumn Festival as a rite of intensification focused on preserving cultural traditions as well as refreshing and strengthening family relationships. I am not exaggerating when I tell you that thousands of years of culture can be preserved in just one little cake. That's just another fine example of how so much meaning can be contained in a place you never thought to look.